Well, hello you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to Usheng Vagush, Monster Killer. <laughs> this is one damn fine fortress in my book. I mean, look at the place. Everyone's just kind of chilling at the moment. The warriors are just back from their raid. Everyone's happy. Bellies are full. Mugs a brimmin. The poets and bards and the goblin dancer, the vomiting goblin dancer, are still here. So everyone's nice and entertained. Very good, very good. And now then, let's uh, take a look here, figure out what we're doing. Well, it's currently the 20th of Sandstone, 260, mid-autumn. So we are approaching winter, which is when the goblins like to strike. So I'm thinking we hold off on the raids just till the spring. Not an idea I'm enamored with, but I figure it's for the best. If a goblin siege pops up, we need to have dwarves here to defend us. Oh, okay, what is this here? Foundations of City Seduce is sought by Romimi Autumnal Swallow and I aim to return it home. My journey began a month ago, and I can only rest when I've brought the prize safely to the bastion of scribing in Twinklefolds. Please, I ask you, do your part to aid me in my quest, and you and your dwarves will become legendary. Another adventurer here seeking our book. I have no idea why they want this thing so badly. What the hell's so special about it? Now, I had looked into Legends mode once again, and this human is from the Untamed Kingdoms, down to the south. It wants to bring this book back to Twinklefolds, which is that center of learning, a place where pretty much all the books in this world are created. But this Romimi Autumnal Swallow who wants the book is an elf, belonging to Ilialetha. And again, I find myself with absolutely no reason to give in to these demands. It's our book. As far as I can tell, we'd be gaining nothing from just giving it to you. And so once again, I decline. Give up your childish errand. This is our book, and it will remain as such. Damn troublemakers. Now we're gonna have to keep an eye on these humans because last time this happened, the warriors left and then immediately returned to try to steal the book. Now last time there was no real threat involved, thankfully, but you never know. So I'll tell you what, I think I'm gonna have my warriors see these humans out. Oh, but hey, before we do that, we have an artifact here. Ezum Egathstukos, the fortress's only priest, has created Mastad Laslem, a green zircon bracelet. He claims it as a family heirloom. Pretty snazzy, let's have a closer look. The shame of puzzles. This is a green zircon bracelet. All craft ship is of the highest quality. On the item is an image of two rectangular cabicons in green zircon. Fairly bare bones, huh? But still fairly interesting, I'd say. This is a bracelet made of a solid chunk of green zircon. Yeah, an impressive thing, really. Well, I know he claimed it as a family heirloom, but I can't help but feel like our queen would love to get her hands on this. Remember, she has a thing for bracelets. Hmm. Well... I suppose you can hang on to it for now, buddy. And also, while we're on the subject of this priest, Ezim's been around for quite some time as the fortress priest. Although we haven't really tended to his needs all that much, he is trying his best as a humble worshipper of Tislam, the god of fertility and food, and also of Delair Azure Steel, the deity of jewels. Hmm, that's probably why he made that bracelet, huh? Yeah, he's been doing his best, but he doesn't really have the resources he needs. The dwarves of Usheng Vagush are, uh, well... Kinda heathens. We don't have any temples or even small shrines at this point. Kinda super shameful, huh? Well, I suppose we're gonna have to look into that. Plus, I'd really like a chance to see more of our gods, too. That would be pretty cool. And I'm sure we'll get to it soon enough. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, because we still have a queen's throne room to attend to. And I think we have to make that our priority. Our queen's been meeting with more and more people lately, and this whole cluttered meeting hall thing really isn't working out too, too well. So yeah, let's start planning that out. And while I'm thinking of it, we can't forget about Taron, this filth-glob forgotten beast. It's still up in the first cavern layer, and I'm still hoping it comes down to that forgotten beast pen that we had made for it last episode. I'm not too sure how high my hopes are at this point, because, I mean, as you can see, it's just kind of sitting... What the hell is this? The human pikeman Dasla Ek Shouty was spotted sneaking around. I'll live to fight another day! It's that damn pikeman that was looking for that book. You rat bastard. Well, first we're gonna pull this lever here so they can't escape the fortress. Not easily anyways. And luckily there is a sand blade right next to them. So, get in there sand blades. Following the human, who is attempting to run back up the stairwell. I don't think they're gonna make it up there though. Hopefully. Oh, and down here. This here is that crossbowman that originally accompanied that pikeman when they were asking for the book. And it looks like they're shooting at my warriors. Well, I guess you both get to die. Let's do it dwarves following the crossbowman, who's trying to go up the rampway. They may very well escape. And this pikeman here is heading up still, it would seem. Oh, but now they're coming back down. That gate must have closed. Oh, but I think they saw a dwarf and are now running back up. You chicken. Oh, and it looks like the dwarf took care of the crossbowman. It was Skull who finished the job. What a beast. Just wrecked her face with his axe. Nice. And the pikeman, I believe, is heading down. 
or back up. She's just panicking at this point. Up and down, oh, and the dwarves are on her and she's dead. Like, immediately. Fantastic work, dwarves. <sighs> okay, once again, we protected the book. And once again, I find myself wondering if it was worth losing their lives. Hmm. Well, not our problem, I guess. All right, anyways, as I was saying, Queen's Throne Room. Right. As I was saying last episode, I think we should make it up this way here, across this chasm. And so let me just, uh, let me just work something up real quick here. Well, we'll start off with a little walkway like this. I just kind of extended this back entrance out and then across. And I do have walls up here, but you know, I'm thinking I might get rid of those. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to do that. Visitors should have to feel that imposing aura as they go to visit the queen, looking out into the dark caverns, walking across this narrow walkway. Yeah, I like that. Oh, and you can see I also blocked in this little stairway right here. This is the one that dwarves use to get down to the workshops. And I'm going to enclose it so that it's not exposed. I might put some fortifications or something in there so the dwarves can still see out though. That'd be pretty neat. Now we're gonna have to put some thought into what the throne room itself is going to look like. Hmm. Yeah, that's gonna take some doing. It has to be just perfect. Alright, so I think I have it planned out now, on a basic level anyways. Now you see that walkway is going to lead over here, leading to a ramp in a very narrow corridor. A ramp that leads downwards, down, down, down to here. And this here is going to be the throne room. It's going to be fairly long, and I'm going to put the queen's throne down at the other end, so that people entering can see her down at the end of the corridor. Very imposing. Yeah, I think that would be pretty cool. And I'm not too sure if I'm going to keep it just stone. We might need to make it, uh, something a bit more awesome silver gold something like that but i'm not too sure yeah we'll figure it out in time baby steps and well i've already been working on it but i have the game paused right now and i figured i'd go ahead and try to explain how i carve out these large chambers now you can see here this blue area that's just a blueprint pretty much we're not going to dig that out just yet but you can see i dug a small tunnel out this way with a staircase at the end leading upwards and if we go up Right here is the very top of that chamber, alright, and I dug that whole level out, smoothed up the walls, and then after that was all set, I channeled out the floor of that level, down to here, which is where we're currently working. And we're almost done with that, there we go, and we'll make each level a little bit wider than the last as we work our way downwards. There we are, all carved out, we'll have to get these gems in the wall replaced with some nice grey stone, all set, good to go, and now we continue downwards, and it's really just as easy as that, just step by step, it's a gradual thing. Alright, come on now. Another human thief was just spotted by a war dog outside. This is getting ridiculous, huh? You stay the hell out of Usheng Bagush. Yeah, I really don't like that. It looks like this bastard's escaping. Ugh, not a big fan. What could we do about that, though? I guess we could start putting stuff up on the surface. Maybe a small barracks for our warriors? And I could just station them in there from time to time? That's an idea. Oh my lord, with these thieves. Get the hell out of here, will ya? Looks like they're fighting with a war dog. Hang in there, pup. Ooh, it's not looking good. Let's go, warriors. Damn, killed the dog. But it allowed the warriors to catch up to the thief, which is now dead. Great work. Oh, yeah, these thieves are getting to be a real pain in my ass. Not great. Just for now, I'm going to station the sand blades outside the front gate, just as a temporary thing. Anyways, back once more to the queen's throne room, which is basically done, really. Just a couple more levels left. No biggie at all, really. Almost there. And you know what, I think before we get to the very bottom, I'm going to engrave some of these walls. And I'll tell you what, I just made it so that only our queen can engrave. I want her to engrave the walls. I mean, it's got to be her throne room after all. Let's see what she does. Ah, and there she goes. Can't help but be curious what she's working on. I'll wait till she's done before we take a peek though. Wouldn't want to spoil the epic saga she's working on. Oh, it's going to be a good one. I know it. And so Obox is going to be working on this for a little bit, I would imagine. And I just remembered we have to do something before the end of the year. It's getting very close at this point. We haven't made any coins this year. We have to remember to do that every year. So let's see. We will mint some gold coins. And we'll make a whole bunch more of them. What the hell, right? Get to it, dwarves. All right, the dwarves are working. And here we are. Now let's take a look here. This is the gold currency of Zugabkovish from the year 260. On the front of the coin is a finely designed image of giant mountain goats. All right, and on the coin's back is a well-designed image of three coins. So for our first year, we had two forgotten beasts in a weapon rack, which seemed to mesh very well with the theme of our fortress. But this one, eh, maybe not so much. I mean, it's definitely silly. Mountain goats? We're in the middle of a desert. And then on the back is three coins. That doesn't make much sense either. I mean, most of our trading is done by giving away rotten goblin clothing. We kind of just hoard the coins. Well, maybe it's a bit more abstract. Perhaps the giant mountain goats represent Usheng Bagush's ability to overcome mountains of adversity. 
And the coins, well, while I would certainly consider this past year to be particularly lucrative, we were able to destroy quite a few goblin pits and managed to get our fair share of loot for the trouble, so I suppose that makes sense too. Well, on second thought, that's a damn fine coin right there. However, next year, let's uh, let's try to keep it a little bit more down to earth, huh? Anyways, well, it looks like Obak is sleeping currently, and she still has a bit to go on those engravings. So in the meantime, let's have a look up here at Teron, our filthy friend. What a pain, this guy has not moved a single inch since last episode. I was really hoping it would come to the fortress at some point, but here we are. We even have dwarves coming to and fro from this tunnel right here, and the thing seems too lazy to come out and attack them. I'm not too sure what its problem is, so I'm curious if we can have a dwarf come up here and carve away this bit of stone next to it, just to kind of rile it up or something, you know? I feel a bit uneasy having this thing wandering around, or just laying here, I guess. So yeah, I think we're gonna do it. Let's try to stir up this beast. First things first, we're going to turn on the meeting hall and residence burrows, just like that, and designate this small space by the blob as part of the burrow. And now we will try to channel out this area right here, next to the blob and someone's on their way. Really hoping this gets that blob moving again, and I'm really, really hoping it doesn't kill the miner. Wow, very tense, but before we get to that, looks like we have an artifact here. MoMA's Rurbim, the Jewel Braid, has created Unos Sodel, a perfect clear zircon. He claims it as an heirloom in the name of the family ancestor, Cole Rhymewheels. Pretty cool. Let's have a look. The Whale of Shielding. This is a perfect clear zircon. All craft is of the highest quality. This object menaces with spikes of smoky quartz. On the item is an image of diamonds in clear zircon, as well as an image of a cassava in clear zircon. Bizarre choice! Alright, so admittedly I did not know what a cassava was, so I just looked it up. What an ugly thing! My god, a perfect clear zircon, with a nasty tuba root thing just smack dab in the middle? What are you doing, my man? But again, you know, whatever. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? Right, anyways, back to Blob Watch. Very exciting. Oh, here they come. Mining? Oh boy, there's a- oh god, that did not go well. Okay. Ooh, just lost a miner right there. Yeah, that did not go over so well at all. Maybe we won't channel this out. Damn, I don't know what we could do. Well, it's a shame we had to lose a rock biter over it, but we have to get this blob moving again. Why won't the damn thing move? Ugh. Yeah, I'm not sure there's anything we can do about it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, not too sure what happened here, but... It looks like that fluffy wombler that we had bought from the elves quite a while back and that I've been drawing in all the pictures, uh, died. <laughs> Just laying here in the hallway. Hmm, not too sure, maybe one of the cats got it. Yeah, I suppose that would happen. <laughs> That's a damn shame right there. But anyways, back to blob watching. Man, this is annoying. I'll tell you what, uh, this is gonna be a big finicky mess again and I don't want to focus too much on this blob nonsense. I'll get back to you if something ends up working. I'm just gonna keep trying stuff. Back down here in the throne room, we have carved it all the way down to the bottom now. And up here, you can see Obak finished her engravings. Very cool, right? Let's have a quick look at that. Let's see, down here on the southern wall, we have an image of a marquee cut gem. Okay. We're followed by an image of half moons, followed by a narrow crescent. After that, we have a series of four pictures, a crossbow bolt, a helm, and then two nearly identical images of the symbol of Ushang Vagush here. A dwarf raising a spear against an evil monster. And then after that we have an image of an earring, which is the symbol of the Grand Lancers, our civilization. And then we have clouds, and then baguette cut gems. Hmm, very, very interesting. Although I'm not sure that it means anything at all. But you know, okay, I'm thinking about it. And I think I got the meaning now. We have gems on either side. Baguette cut gems and marquee cut gems. That's just kind of like a design. A border, right? Then over here we have half moons in a narrow crescent, both representing the moon, I'm thinking. The passage of time, perhaps? And then over here we have a pair of images, the symbol of our civilization, and clouds, perhaps a commentary on the state of our civilization. Wispy, insubstantial, barely clinging on, and could be gone at any moment. But here in the middle we see a scene, a battle scene, I'm thinking? We have a crossbow bolt, a helm, and then two of Ushang Vakush's symbols, which is a dwarf fighting off a monster of evil. Yeah, I'm thinking that looks like one big battle scene. You know what, maybe it does make sense after all. Our civilization is just wisping away, but through battle and conquest, we will prevail. And then time will continue forward, as it always does. And then up here on the other wall, we have another image of our civilization's earring, followed by a, a cucumber vine, and then a custard apple tree, and then a floodgate, a cardinal man, our fortress's symbol once again, and a leaf. And then on the other side we have a candle nut, an animal trap, and dwarves. 
Hmm. Interesting. A little bit more abstract than thinking. But you know, I think I'm starting to put it together. Yeah, yeah, I could see it now. All right, so work with me here. We have this earring here representing our civilization. And following that, we have a cucumber vine and a custard apple tree, as well as a couple other plants. So I'm kind of picturing a forest scene. We even have a cardinal man perched up in a tree. Now over on the right side here, we have some dwarves in an animal trap. Now at first, I kind of took that as some comedy relief. But then I took note of the floodgate and our fortress's symbol here. I can't help but think that the plants might represent something else. The goblins, perhaps? Or maybe even the elves? Both have quite robust civilizations in this world. And then right here in the middle of it all, we have Ushang Vagush, trying to hold back the tide with its pitiful floodgate. So I'm thinking the dwarves in their animal trap over on this side represent more the dwarven ability to outthink their enemies. We have to be smart, we have to plan, we have to make traps, you know? Yeah, you know what? That makes perfect sense. I like it. Man, I'll tell you, that Obak, quite a craft dwarf. Major kudos. Anyways, yeah, just getting stuff finished up in here. And it's a damn shame we couldn't get that throne room done in time. Because the elves are here once more. Bunch of bastards. Ah, greetings once more, Queen of the Born Dunes. I trust this past year has been kind to you. <laughs> once more, we must discuss the trees surrounding your desert home. As you well know, we elves are quite partial to them, and we are loath to spare a single branch to your senseless slaughter. And once again, we find ourselves generous enough to allow you to cap your tree fells. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. we'll do it. We grant your request. Once more. Oh, that is wonderful. Now, let's see, this year, we can part with at most 103 trees. Butcher, we were far too kind on you last year. 118, what were we thinking? We can abide by this. We're done here, right? <laughs> Quaint. Rest assured that the elves of Ilialetha thank you for your ability to restrain your animal urges. And until next we meet, gentle Obak, I bid you adieu. <laughs> Those damn elves, I'll tell ya. I realize we're still playing along with our games, but believe me, I'm not very happy about it. Those rats will get theirs one day. We just have to think, use our minds, you know? Ah, the Forgotten Beast. The first one this episode. The Forgotten Beast Zungo has come. A gigantic hairy leech. It has a broad shell and it belches and croaks. Its azure hair is unkempt. Beware its deadly blood. Nothing to be afraid of here. Well, besides deadly blood, I suppose. But I mean, come on. It's a leech. It does have a shell though, which is pretty neat. Maybe we'll have to make a new batch of gauntlets. What do you say? All right, well, it looks like it's on the first cavern level, nearby our blob friend. A little worrisome. So I'm gonna get everyone to the meeting hall and residence level. Let's go dwarves. And I'm really hoping this leech doesn't kill our blob friend. Guess you never know. All right, it's moving in in the water here. And here we have Teron, still not moving. Even the slightest, very annoying. Oh, and the leech up here just killed a giant mole. Oh, pretty cool, actually. The leech bit this giant mole in the head, which caused the head to explode, and then the leech sucked all the blood out of the mole. <laughs> so cool. Let's just hope it doesn't happen to one of the dwarves. And still, our blob friend sits. Useless thing. And the damn leech is doing the same thing. What the heck, you lazy beasts? Let's go. Also, I am still trying to get this blob to come over towards this staircase. I'd really hate for it to get killed by that leech. Oh, damn it. Oh, come on. Oh, that didn't work either. Damn me. Oh, but it does look like the blob is moving away now. And coming back. All right, I tell you what, it doesn't look like anything's working. It looks like we're gonna have to figure out a way to terminate this creature. It's too dangerous. And I think I know just how to do it. It's just gonna kind of be a pain in the ass. Anyways, I'm sick of looking at this creature. So let's have a look down this way to a place we haven't addressed in quite some time, the crock pit. Now, if we look down, we can see that it still has a, a few goblins in here. Big dogs as well. Still sloshing around in this corpse-laden goo. Pretty gross. I think it's time we dealt with those guys. And so we're gonna come down here and pull this lever, right here, which should drain out the crock pit. Let's see. Oh yes, there it goes. Water is draining out now, out into the caverns. Very good. And soon enough, it'll all be drained out, which is great because our previous brood of cave crocodiles has finally reached adulthood. And there are quite a few of them too. Fantastic news. Oh my goodness, I just paused the game. It looks like Teron has spotted some of the dwarves working down in the caverns here. Horrible news, actually. Okay, um, all right, following the beast, who's spraying its vapor all over the place. Not too sure what it's doing. Just kind of standing in this stairwell and moving slowly back down into the water. What a pain, huh? 
It seems fairly content just to sit in the water right in this exact spot. It's chosen layer, I suppose. Very annoying. Well, I'm gonna keep the dwarves working up here for now. It's gonna be a bit risky, but we have to kill this beast. And this is the only safe way. And just a quick look at the leech, who is as well in the same exact spot that we left him. That is strange, huh? Well, anyways, having a look down here in the crocodile pit, the water is very shallow now, and the goblins are running around like idiots, panicking because there's finally some sort of activity going on. They're probably confused, trying to figure out what's going on, which is totally understandable because they've been down here dealing with this corpse slurry for two years now. Poor bastards. And so now that it's nice and shallow in there, I'm going to station some troops. How about the recruits? We'll station them down here, just by this downward staircase. Oh yes, goblins. A change is coming, although I'm not too sure you're going to be fans of it. You ready, recruits? We have some goblins to kill. Now let's see if I can remember which lever does what. I think it's this one. Guess we'll find out. Oh yes, there we are. We have access. Alright troops, get down there. And there we go. Wasn't too hard at all, seemingly. I didn't even see any of the goblins. <laughs> yep, looks like we're all cleared out. And now we'll start resetting the crocodile pit. Got a whole bunch of junk to clean out here. That's unfortunate. But in the meantime, we can start stationing cave crocodiles down here. So hopefully this time we'll have two times the amount of cave crocodiles in here. And this time we'll also try to get water in here before goblins arrive. Last time it was still dry. So I think that'll make a big difference. There we are, yep. Just this way, crocodiles. To your new home. I'm sure you'll find it to your liking. Alright, yo, whoa. What's going on right here? It looks like Teron has moved up towards that leech. They caught wind of each other, perhaps? It looks like Teron is trying to push the leech out of its territory. Following Teron who is spraying vapor all over the place. They are fighting, fighting, vapor, a lot of it. And it looks like the leech killed Teron. Go figure, huh? I thought for sure the leech would get killed by those fumes, but it seems to be doing absolutely fine. Hmm, well that solves that problem. Although now I'm not too sure what we're gonna do about this leech. What a pain. Well, it's a shame we're not gonna be able to see this device that I had created to kill the blob. Basically, I was having the dwarves carve out a plug of stone from the ceiling here, right above the beast. And I was going to have them drop that plug straight onto the blob. Oh, damn it. Ugh. Haban Salab the Bam has been found dead. One of our rock biters. In fact, he's one of the first seven dwarves who founded Usheng Vagush. Damn it, that really stinks. Killed by a cave toad. Just in this narrow tunnel right here. I hate when that happens, you know? We've lost too many good dwarves this episode. I didn't think this was going to be a big deal. My dwarves are constantly tussling with cave crocodiles, giant cave toads, all kinds of cave monsters. It usually never ends up being anything. But here we are. Just an unfortunate accident, I guess. <sighs> Such is life here in the Born Dunes. I'll have to make a new silver statue for the Hall of Heroes. He certainly deserves it. A very humble fellow, very soft-spoken, but the fortress would not be here without his help. And so yes, he's a hero in my book. Rest well, buddy. Well, in other good news, the crocodile pit is finally cleaned up. Still a bit muddy in here, but that's okay. All the crocodiles have been thrown in, and we're about to get it all closed up once more. And now we can start pumping water back in. Very exciting. Oh, and before I forget, I suppose I'll show off this rock plug dropping mechanism that I had created for the filth blob. I mean, it's gonna be useless now, but I could still show you how it works. Now I made a staircase over here in the ceiling that goes up to this level, and then down over here you can see there's nothing, but above that, there is this plug of cobaltite, which is suspended by this support, which is above it. Now that support is linked up to this lever right here, and so when we pull that lever, somebody's on their way. Oh, and there we are. A section of the cavern has collapsed. Unpaused, you can see all that dust sprays out all over the place. And down here, that chunk of cobaltite fell right where Terran was. It would've worked, I'm telling you. Quite a shame. Oh well. Anywho, we can see a dwarf up here working the pump, getting our crock pit nice and filled up with water. Very good. And okay, I need to focus for a second. I feel like we've been all over the place this episode. Oh, actually, here's something. As a little side project, I didn't mention it. I've had the dwarves getting rid of all the boulders here in our entry hall. So look, it's finally cleared out. Isn't that something? Been meaning to get around to that for quite some time. And also, up here, our living quarter. That's all cleared out too. Looking damn fine, wouldn't you say? Again, it's about damn time. But, it's done now, so, good. And we've also gotten rid of all the rocks and boulders that were here in the throne room, which is now also smooth. Very nice, huh? But it is also pretty barren in here. So we're gonna have to think of something to put in here. Probably gonna be a slow process, but it'll get done, no worries. Actually, up over this way, I created a small metalsmith forge next to this stockpile, in which there is a bronze throne. Now, I made the queen's throne out of bronze because she is quite partial to it, and I have this small pile and this metalsmith forge linked up, so now I believe I can stud this throne with some sort of metal. And let's see, how about we stud this throne with gold? 
Sensible, right? Let's give it a try. Oh boy. We get no peace around here, I'll tell you. Another forgotten beast. The forgotten beast Bax has come. A towering, hairy tick. It has large mandibles and it squirms and fidgets. Its light brown hair is short and even. Beware its webs. Another webby beast. And this one's a tick. I would have to imagine it can suck blood like that leech. Interesting, it looks to be on the first cavern layer, but uh, let's have a closer look. Uh, yes, yes it is. All right, well, that's interesting. Let's uh, send the dwarves to the burrows. There you go. And now we're following the tick, who appears to be moving right in. I don't think it's blocked up by trees. No, it's definitely not. All right, this could be an interesting thing right here. It seems to be heading for those tunnels that we had constructed for that blob. Well, it certainly is a shame that we couldn't get that blob stuck in our pen trap. But if we can get a webby tick in there, well, that might be cool too. Let's see how this goes. Yeah, it's heading straight down. All right, this is very interesting. Ready with those levers, dwarves? Yeah, it's coming straight in. Oh, oh, it's fighting something. A human axe man who has been killed. Not an issue. All right, the creature's still coming down towards the fortress. All right, I'm gonna have a dwarf come down here and preemptively pull this lever. Come on, let's go, dwarves. Hurry up. And we're gonna lock this door behind them and then cancel this lever pull, just so we have a dwarf in this room. Now, taking a look down here at Bax, it is just moments away from entering this pen, so I am going to have him pull that lever. All right, go for it, dwarf. Following the beast, who's moving in, spraying webs at these rabbits, and... Oh, come on! Oh, God! All right, all right, it's coming towards the fortress now. Oh, boy. Um... That's not fantastic. It looks like we didn't have this bridge down here linked up. I mean, it just, it never fails. Oh, that would have been so cool, too. Damn it. What is wrong with me? Ugh. Okay. So we have a webby tick moving in towards the fortress now. Okay. Don't panic. The beast is going to come over here and go up the ramp into the fortress, I'm thinking. But of course, over this way here, we have some dwarves carrying some items back to the fortress. It may end up spotting them and heading down to the south which would kind of stink because I'm sure it would kill all these dwarves. But we have to also remember that our barracks lies in between the living quarter and where the beast is. But unfortunately, only the recruits are here in the barracks currently. That being said, our recruits now have quite a bit of skill with their weapons, which is good to see. I'm sure they could handle the beast well enough. It's just those webs that I'm concerned about. We certainly have to hope they can take the beast out before it charges up here to the living quarter where all of my civilians and children are. Yeah, that could be a real slaughter. Not a stellar thing. Oh, jeez, you know, I just realized something else, too. Something that's even worse. Yeah, this episode... It's gonna end on the cliffhanger. Damn it. Yeah, sorry, guys. But I really don't want to cram this whole thing in at the end of the episode. So, we're gonna hold off. Terribly sorry. And remember that I do not write these things into the story. It just kind of happens this way. In fact, at this point, it's a cliffhanger for me, too. So just relax, huh? With the ancient terror known as Bax... Heading towards the fortress, will the dwarves of Usheng Bagush be able to overcome this newest threat? Or will they succumb to a tangle of sticky webs and sucking mouth parts? Find out next time. Here in Usheng Bagush, Monster Killer! And until then, you bearded bastards.